is backish. Yeah. Uh, so we're here. Let's, <laughs> um, let's look at model comparison. So if I wanted to say now which model is best, we can use the ANOVA function and you just fill in the names of the models. Um, so I could look at my AICs. Sometimes people are attached to rules though, and there are no good rules about how much the difference has to be. There's some people trying to work this problem out, but anytime we apply cutoffs and make things black and white, it gets tricky. Um, so we just want the one with the lowest AIC, which is our model with both nested values. Or if, you're if you love p-values, this is a chi-square difference test. Uh, and the last one appears to probably be the best based on both rules. It, so we'd want to continue using both variables. <clears throat> if this one wasn't important, we could jump back to just the participant one. It's <laughs> fine. That positive feedback. Uh oh. So the hypothesis part, right? So we're switching from, if I back up two slides, a one here for the only the intercept this summer. Now we're gonna add in all of our fixed effects. And this is where you could go nuts. You could add in interactions. You could do a hierarchical regression with one variable at a time. So this is sort of your normal regression moment. Um, so I'm just changing out the one for, I just threw them all in at once, simultaneous regression. Um, remember the order doesn't matter. Let's see. And this interpretation here is the same as regular regression. So now, controlling for the way I like write these up. So controlling for the correlated error of participants in trials. What I see is my, my group. Um, so if you have a categorical variable, we're comparing this to it looks like interpreter. Um, if you wanted a different one, you just reorder the labels. But this first group, uh, and so LAL. It's going to be your advanced L2. Yes. Compared to interpreters is four points higher, or 0.04, so proportion, so 4%. May I ask something? Sure. What, what do the p values refer to in this? Yeah. It's the, uh, this is B, so uh, coefficient. So it's testing if that coefficient is different from zero. Right, so it's based on this T. Your degrees of freedom is uh, nested, so it's not the. 26,000 to 200,000 lines, but it is more than you would have if you were comparing in a t-test, right, with that averaged across all of those people and compared 13 people to 13 people. Um, so you're getting the benefit of all of the trials. So how, how is this collapsing across the data and still having, or sorry, not collapsing across the data and making sure that each participant is taking into account differently and also having large degrees of freedom as if you're collapsing? Does that make sense? Yes. So <clears throat> we are controlling for estimating, so here, we get 624, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, in this example, there's 64 trials and, six, and 624 per participants per trial, right? <clears throat> um, so what's happening is to get to 556, it's subtracting an estimation for intercept for each person. Right. And the uh, intercept for trials, or it might just be for trials. Can I get, yeah, so 624 minus 64 estimating the trials. So it's allowing um, each data point to count, but it's nesting them together. Right. So I have 624 nested data points mm -hmm. minus estimating for the trials. So that's where I get 556. Sorry, I said think about what order it goes in. Um, so it's not the full 236,000 lines that you have. Um, it accounts for how much you've controlled for the structure of the data. But if I were to do this as a regular t-test, this would be 13 people in each group, which minus two, 24 degrees of freedom. And now, what is, what is in the, um, I, if this is right, you get to a specific, tell me so. Um, when you're calculating this t-value, you subtract the, um, the score from the population mean divided by the standard of the mean, so on and right. so forth. What's on the standard of the mean in this? 
Senator, um, so for this one, it's the difference between the mean groups after controlling for correlated error. Wait, wait, differences right. between groups. Because a predictor that is um, categorical is like group one minus group two, or group two minus group one. Oh, group so the difference is coming from those collapsed groups. Right, so that. And that's collapsed across participants and across trials, is that right? Yes. Okay. Controlling for all these other things. So sometimes if you just calculated the group averages, they won't subtract quite the same because you're still controlling for the other conditions and the uh, nesting variables. Um, so 0.04 is the difference between those. So the second group is higher. And then the T value here is calculated by the standard error of that difference. So it's taking 0.04 divided by 0.017, and that's where this 2.36 is. Another reason I love this package is that it doesn't star anything. <laughs> right. um, <clears throat> but if we use our traditional 0.05 cutoff, you know, pros and cons there, that's a different lecture. Um, we can tell that our advanced L2 group appears to be doing better than our interpreter group. Uh, and our monolingual group also doing better. Our interpreter group, if you wanted to know advanced L2 versus monolingual, you have to restructure and rewrite. <laughs> What makes sense in your data? You probably want all three comparisons. So I would tell you to run this one, reorder the labels, and run it again. Because that doesn't change the other variables. It'll just change those. Uh, your no figurative groups, so figurative versus no figurative, so no figurative is lower. Hopefully that's mm -hmm. what you were hoping for. Yeah. And then the English, um, comparison point doesn't appear to be any, any differences. So the interpretation is just like a normal <coughs> regression. Um, for kind of a preview of uh, thinking about assumptions, you can use this correlation table here to make sure that there's no multicollinearity in the data after controlling for everything. Um, it's a little weird on categorical variables, but we still want to make sure none of them are perfectly correlated, but you usually ignore the intercept. Looking at these, they're pretty much not correlated. Can I? Yeah. So the um, intercept line is comparing uh, the, the value of 0.45 ish to mm -hmm. zero, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the key, key test. Is it a way? There's a, is there a way to make it compare that to 0.5 because that's that's the, the normal chance. hypothesis in this case? Yeah. And when I say, is there a way? I mean, like, is there a quick way? Not like. A, yeah. Right. So I think what you would do. No. So it's not a param just a little parameter in the function that yeah. you're setting. Yeah. Not really. So I, I have done this exact question before. What we did is we took that value, and um, uh, did a single sample t where we subtract the population parameter, which would be 0.5 in your uh -huh. case, and then the hard part was figuring out the right standard error for uh, that parameter. Because that standard, I mean, you could probably use yeah, that what's one. what's the error yeah, of chance? Because this is what this is doing is doing 40.45 minus zero divided by 0 0.02. So you could do 0.45 minus 0 0.5 divided by 0.02. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Um, Given the very small standard, it's, the, the bigger issue is like with that kind of degrees of freedom, everything is yeah, significant. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I was just like wondering if theoretically it's possible. Yeah. Then I might tell you to calculate like a Cohen's D measure to make sure that it's practically interesting. Mm -hmm. right. And I could talk about effect size all day as well, so don't let me go that route. <laughs> um, right. So. Kind of reminder, these are coefficients like regression for a continuous predictor, which we'll look at one in a minute, for every <coughs> unit increase in x, that's b unit increases in y, and categorical predictors is the difference between your comparison or reference group and the second group for interpretation purposes. Um, now, if we wanted to add a random slope, I picked one. I didn't know what would be interesting. Uh, in your study, if you would expect there to be random slopes, so you, in your study, you may not expect to there any of these to really be wild. <laughs> like, if you think that participants' unique experiences are going to give them different 
um, abilities at predicting the figure, the, the next word, then I would pick that variable for the random slope. You could also add multiple variables, but the, I wanted to show you guys how to add it, and it goes in the front. So instead of replacing, you replace the one with the variable you expect for the random slope. Um, and so that's, uh, I can pick the English one by trials, and then English one's also by participants. So you can see how this part can get really wild. Like you have a bunch of things going on. If you wanted multiple random slopes, you would just add another one. So there would be maybe um, the group by trial. So do we have that other upper belief to like coma, like this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. The so tilde. We try it on. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you, so you could add just another one in the list function. So this okay. is the list. Oops. Add them till it explodes. I, I really, I recommend on these adding one thing at a time though, mm -hmm. just so if it does uh, explode, you know where. Um, and then I know I have in my examples later, so I'll show you some examples of error messages to look out for. Because um, I also teach structural equation modeling and uh, unfortunately I don't think the package for that does a very good job of presenting errors. So I always have to tell students like, don't forget to look at this. Uh, and this one can be the same way. Like the error can get hidden in all the outputs, so it does get long. Okay. All right, so with a random slopes model, we get more of the random pieces up in front. Uh, one thing to notice is that the random intercepts, it sometimes it tends to switch to the slope. So the, the variability can, can move, essentially, from one component to another as you are controlling for different ones. Um, so for trials, we don't tend to see, it's not very big, so 0.032. Um, and so that's the variance on that slope. So how much people, how much the slopes are varying by trial? And that's a really interesting question because, for example, we have items sometimes that don't work. And so if you have a high variability here, you might look at each individual trial and see if there is one trial that's particularly bad or a set of trials. So it, to me, it allows you to kind of think about more about your data design. Um, so for example, I have people rating questions, my family feud example, and a hero, not a euro, a hero is a very large sandwich. That is not a thing that they understood in Mississippi. Worked great in Texas, didn't work in Mississippi, and that's how we were able to figure it out. Um, so our our um, slopes for that trial were crazy. Um, and removing that item, everything else kind of normalized out. So that's, this is English by trial, the English by participant. So we get, you can see there's a lot more variability there on whether or not the, their slope um, for that particular parameter uh, varies by participant a lot more. It's about 10%. 10% is not chance clearly, but that's a, that's a large chunk on a scale from zero to one. Now, what you'll see is that all these have not really Changed is this one that's now, um, it decreased a little bit. It was already not really that different, but probably it's not really that different because what you're seeing is a lot of variability between people. Okay. So it's not a parameter that we can predict with very well because there is so much variability in people. Okay. Um, I find random slopes hard sometimes just because they're difficult to explain. Like, what does, exactly does that mean? So each participant has a different effect from figurative to not figurative, or figurative, not figurative to figurative in this example. Um, and that effect is ranging uh, up to 0.10, right? It can't go below 0.01 because the data bottoms out at zero. All right, so questions on that? So sometimes we don't do random slopes because they just, if I can't explain it, then why would I model it? Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. So, yeah. so with regard to that um, example with the hero, mm -hmm. then do you leave, I mean, clearly, like, for the next round, you take that item out. Mm -hmm. But for that round, do you then take that item out to see how your participants behave and sort of by them condition? Yeah, so what? I don't remember which paper this ended up in, but in that analysis, we included it 
and then said, okay, we then went in and looked at this more and figured out it's this item and we took it out and here's the numbers now. So we presented both. Um, sometimes reviewers don't, it depends on what kind of reviewer you get, right? Ones that are more familiar with this idea of transparency, um, reporting analyses, some people were like, I'll just take it out, it doesn't matter. I'm like, but clearly I need to tell you that this item was a problem. <laughs> um, we said we were gonna run 120 and then magically the degrees of freedom don't match that, right? Um, so um, we convinced them to let, leave it in. I can't, this paper's been so many years ago. I just remember the example as a good example of items that don't work. Um, <clears throat> so present both, see what happens. Worst they could do is tell you to take one out and you can go, no, open science. Mm -hmm. right. uh, okay, so still, these are still coefficients um, and interpreting this is generally you're looking at the standard deviation to see how much they vary. But now that we have, since we have two levels, you can actually see how much they vary around each one. So I can see variation by trial and variation by, by participant. Um, so you can see if it's more of an issue, the variance is due to your trials, which you don't almost kind of not want, but expect given that you're giving them different types of trials. Um, but really the variation is individual differences. If I compare these models, so I dropped the first two, you can do this all at once at the end too. Um, I can tell that adding the fixed effects was important, so it's got some predictive value there, but adding that random slope was not helpful. Okay. Um, probably because I picked a predictor that isn't significant. And on that note, I'm gonna do effect size. Um, there aren't a whole lot of good effect sizes for this. Most people are familiar with R squared for regressions. Um, this is kind of the best one. Uh, it's based on several new papers on trying to figure out how to do effect sizes for multi-level models. Uh, and it's still not by predictor. It's a whole model. Uh, so the package is M-U-M-I-N, multiple inference something, I don't remember exactly. And so for these types of models, you use R squared GLMM. And I just did it for model three because that was the one that fit the best. And so it tells me, unfortunately, that the um, predictive value is like pretty small for the model uh, and a little bit better when I include the random effects. So R2M is the only the fixed effects and then R2C, I don't know why it's C, is both. So that's like an overall. And it does warn you that's a revised statistic only because there's um, a new paper out that they updated for from the same people. <laughs> yeah? Could you say this again? So the random effect that we picked. Trial and participant. Right. So it could have been, you could have picked another random effect if I understand it? You could have just used trial or just used participant or if you had a reason to pick a different variable Generally, the random effects are how you're, the, the error that you're expecting based on participantness or trial items. I think it's the way that the data is hierarchically structured. So I have uh, trials that each participant has taken is the way we've structured it. Did that get your question? Well, it's not. Oh, you still have yeah. <laughs> the processing? But, but what this is telling you is that if you include the random effect, your model is better, although it's still pretty low. And that, those numbers refer to the effect sizes that you gain by adding the, the fixed effects to the model? Yeah, so this, yeah, this one's just fixed effects, this one's both. It's both. Yeah. Why, why is it um, saying R2M and R2C? Is that because of the data set? What is no, it? that's just how they've labeled them oh. now, but. It, if you so the package labels them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, if you uh, do like question mark r dot squared GLMM, it explains to you how they calculate these. It's the, um, the differences in variances, like residual variance, total, you know, the variance accounted for by your fixed effects divided by residual. This one adds fixed and random effects um, divided by residual. Uh, if you like the math part. Uh, my thing is though, you'll always see, hopefully, if you're if your random effects or your random intercepts uh, are a 
important, this number will always be larger. I mean, obviously we want our fixed effects to be more important um, for hypothesis testing, but this can allow us to see like how much variability there is based on individual differences. And so that could be theoretically interesting too. You could say like there are two types of people apparently. Yes, so uh, another study that I have, we were looking at daily diary data and we were able to show that like 65% of the variance was just due to people mm -hmm. being people um, having different days. And so they, they presented that as, as an interesting component. Mm -hmm. So can you say a little bit more about that and the random effect in the diary study? I can't actually. Uh, if you give me like four slides, I can just show you the study because I have it as one of the examples. Okay, so it's coming. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's what it's our growth example. Um, so a quick note on assumptions on these. Uh, I was only going to do this part once. Um, so for additivity, so that's the good thing. Uh, Multicollinearity is the bad thing. You just want to look at the correlation table here. Uh, sometimes when models break and they don't run, that will be where you can find that the, um, the variables are too correlated with each other. After controlling, they don't look correlated and then you control for the error and they are. <coughs> uh, you can also use the plot function for homogeneity and um, a little bit of homoscedasticity. We've kind of tried to control for it based on participants. Now we're getting this censoring um, because your data is zero to one. So there's still a little bit of problems with some homogeneity between groups. Okay. Um, it's not horrible because of the censoring. But. And then you can also look at linearity and normality. Right. So this is a QQ plot. Right. You want it to kind of line up in a nice neat little line. And you can do it actually by level. So here this level equals one is the first random effect, which is our trial. And so that's why there are, oh, sorry, this is actually participant. That's mislabeled. This is by participant. Um, pretty good. And then a second random effect uh, by trials. Okay. I think I have that right. I might have this mislabeled. I'll check that out for you guys. Um, but both of them look good. So otherwise, our assumptions are pretty, pretty good. Would we not know from the number of points that we're taking? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, it's... This one I think is trial. I think I have it right. This is trial and then this is participant within trials. So that's why there are so many. Because it's each participant's data point within trials, 600 points. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found this code last night and I was like, oh, things, new things I've learned today. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So kind of a quick summary of that, and then I have two more examples that we, it kind of sounds like the growth example is uh, interesting to people, and then I have a, a nonlinear example. I uh, just wanted to have a, a, a good mix of different things. Um, so models are built up in steps. We're gonna use the ANOVA function to compare them. Um, interpretation is regression still. And MU, MIN is a good package for effect size, and this is where I'm hoping people's research kind of starts coming out because I would really love one by predictor, which predictor was the most influential in my model. There was a guy doing some really cool stuff on Twitter with uh, variance components, trying to show how much variance went to each model, but it's apparently pretty tricky because of the, the nested part of it. It's not like in um, regular regression where it's, you can look at the overlap between each one. <coughs> All right, so this growth example. Um, when, I, when I say I'm doing a growth model, I usually mean structural equation modeling, um, but this is a good lecture to prep you for that idea um, because latent growth models follow a similar pattern. Right? You tend to start with like an empty model, then you add um, random intercepts, then you add your fixed slope effects, and then you add random slopes, and so it actually follows this kind of structure. Um, but we could also build growth models into regression. So if you look at tutorials online, essentially they're doing these multi-level models with time as a variable. So it's really just a way that we're describing them as growth models. Um, but if you see someone saying I'm doing a latent growth model, that means usually structural equation modeling because that latent word. But if they talk about growth models, they're just giving their regression a fancy name. 
So the diary study. Um, so I called my friend last night, hey, can I use your data? <laughs> so I restructured it a little bit so that I can, well, I took out participant number basically. But um, what they're interested in is, uh, this is a group I work with who looks at um, reactions to disasters. So they are clinical psychologists, real psychologists, if you will. Um, I also work with real doctors. Yeah, those, the rest of us don't count. Uh, and uh, are they trying to essentially see what we can do to better prepare people for resiliency after disasters? So it's there in Mississippi, there's lots of tornadoes and hurricanes, so how do we help um, especially minority populations respond well to um, and be resilient, right? Because it predicts better mental health outcomes. Um, so their IVs looking at were, I'm sorry? Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, their IVs are mindfulness and time. See, I can make fun of them because I work with them all the time. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that to a person I wouldn't know. Um, mindfulness and time. So we me they measured this across 14 days. Uh, I don't know how they got the freshmen to do this, but they did. Uh, and then looked at values progress. So this is... Um, adherence to values, goals, and their progress at adhering to their own goals. This is very positive psych, logotherapy kind of stuff. Okay. So I could nest by participant and by time. Because time is really the structure of the data. Wait, could you say what the dependent variable was again? Yes, so values, progress. So how much I feel like I'm adhering to my own life goals and progressing towards achieving those goals. Okay. So just like scale, one to seven? Mm -hmm. uh, all, all of these are except time. Okay. The real study had a lot more variables in it. I just kind of reduced it to make it a simple example. So simple data set. Uh, our mindfulness variable, obviously this is um, measured once, pre-study. Okay. Um, and then our progress variable, this is by different participants. This should not actually be the same unless they literally answered 18 every single time. Um, and our real time variable. So one thing that I do when I measure things by time is, uh, let's say you're doing a, a, a daily blast, or you're texting them, please respond to our study. Right? People respond at different times. So I try not to treat that as a dichotomous time one, time two variable. What we do is we measure it from the start of the experiment. So here's point zero. Here's their um, time that they responded to point one and we subtract them. So that's why it's not whole numbers. Um, so this would be this, the second time, the third time, uh, based on when they responded. This is also for the variability during the day to really be captured because if a participant is responding once a day and they respond six hours later, they've had six hours of living that could have, something could have happened. Um, so we treat time, try to treat it as continuously as possible. Uh, and then the models are the same. So I'm uh, mostly going to try to interpret this one for you guys instead of telling you the code. But in our intercept only model, what we see is that on average, participants' value scores are hovering around 13. Okay, that's about the middle of the scale. Okay. Uh, if I control for participant number here in my random effect, we see is that people's scores vary over from about 10 to about 16. So the reason I wanted to highlight this one was the interpretation of the random effect is in the scale of the data. Okay. So before we were talking about how 0.02 was small because it's a proportion. Now that we have scores that range from, oh gosh, five to something, I think. Um, three or four points is not a huge amount, but it's uh, a couple of, of answers answered a slightly different way. Okay. So always make sure you're thinking about this in the scale of the data. Now I can see that I have 12,000 observations but 94 participants. Okay. So I've nested now by participant. And I left it alone here because time I'm going to use as a, as a factor instead of a random component. as a moderation model, 
um, so we looked at the interaction between mindfulness and time. So the idea was that if, uh, as the study goes, we're like telling them, think about being mindful, doing, like we're prodding them every day. So this kind of works as a priming variable, although priming to clinicians doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, it's this idea that just by forcing them to think about it, maybe their behaviors are changing over time. Um, so we were really interested in if, if we're moving mindfulness and uh, across time, because we're testing them across time, this variable actually is across time, um, then maybe we're also changing progress, but it depends on if they're changing together or not. Uh, so getting confused with the real study, they had this like pretest that they also used for a bunch of variables. <clears throat> And the short answer is like mindfulness does appear to predict progress um, such that for every point one, <laughs> for every one unit increase in mindfulness, we're getting point one increase in progress. Um, but that scale is much smaller. So you could, if you wanted um, standardized effects, you would just z-score your variables first. And that would give you um, a beta value. Across time, they do appear to be changing. So we were. This is where the growth part comes in. Um, we seem to. It seems that progress across time, just because we're measuring them, is going up. And so that was something they were really interested in. Although I would be very cautious about the effect because uh, without once you z-score them, you can tell that's not a, a big number. Uh, and then there maybe is an interaction. I do have to be, uh, be careful that when you're interpreting the like assumptions here, this is gonna obviously be correlated to this interaction. So I should have scaled all of this data first to do a proper moderation. Uh, but I wanted part of it to break. So, uh, but I actually think it's the next model that uh, runs poorly. <laughs> so if I were doing this for real, I would then break down the moderation and see what, what the numbers meant. Um, to just show you guys what I uh, random slopes model would look like for time though, and these are more popular for growth models, is including the, the growth variable as a random slopes. Okay. Um, because then that implies that people are growing at different rates, and that might be a very interesting question. So how much is the variability in the growth or decrease in there? So I just stuck in time. So time is now actually in the model and is a random effect. Okay. So they're not completely separate things is what I want to highlight here, uh, that um, <clears throat> a variable can be both a fixed effect and a random effect. So let's see, what do we got? Um, so time, it, it's interesting, when you throw this in, check out what happens to the model though. These predictors are not changing very much in their size, but if we get interested in significance levels, they do actually disappear because we're accounting for that variance is moving from like being part of the prediction to part of the um, random slope. And so you could say the effect sort of goes away uh, because what we see is that there's actually quite a bit of variability in the predictor. Thanks guys. Um, so, uh, what I was trying, what we did, we didn't end up doing this model for the paper. This was a, an idea they were trying, but what we were arguing, what we spent a lot of time arguing about, is the fact that this real, this time predictor, the growth of participants, is really variable. So for some participants, they're probably growing almost none. Like 0.10 is really shallow slope. For some participants, they're growing a lot more. So you see this wide variability in their change across time for progress. Um, and by making it a random slope, I can now see how much variability there is, and I can see that that's actually what's driving the effect of the study. Okay. So uh, how does over time thing not confounded with how many times are you getting to answer your, you know, to do your task, and that you're getting better at doing the task? Oh, yeah, it's a very cognitive, question to ask, um, so. Because I know it takes me a while to like keep myself responsible. Right. Accountable to like a task demand, and I don't do it well in the beginning, but if there's enough. Reminders. 
Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, that's but a great question. Uh, so because I'm a little confused about putting time both as a fixed it's effect and a random one. So um, if I remember how the study ran, because I wasn't part of that, I'm just on the numbers end. Um, what they did was they prompted people to respond. I think maybe they got one reminder. So each day they were getting like, respond to our study and they get one reminder. But if they don't respond to day one, it's just missing data. Um, if they respond to day two, we have a time marker for when they responded. Mm -hmm. um, here I have it as a fixed effect saying, okay, what's the average, you can think about this as what's the average participant change across the study? And so it's about 0.3. Um, but if I look at the standard deviation, the random slopes component, it is changing by 0.2, so this number. So that to me implies that people are ranging from 0.10 to, if I can math, 0.5. Um, that's one standard deviation around it. So it ranges from basically none or maybe even negative to much more steep. So I jumped in kind of late to the part, I'm sorry, I'm the, I, the issue would be if you didn't include it as a random effect, then you would be assuming that the growth for every participant is the same. Yes. Right, so what this does is it allows you to enter that variability for every participant. Yeah, no, I'm fine with having it as a random effect. I'm confused about having it both as a random effect. And a fixed. Well, right. if you don't have it as a fixed effect, then, I mean. Then you're not you testing it as a variable. It's not a random intercept, it's a random slope, right? Right, yeah. in this model, yeah. So it's not really, it's not the same random effect like you would Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Um, yeah. Hmm? yeah. So for each um, point increase in real time, you get 0.33-ish increase in progress. Is that right. right? And that's quite variable because the standard deviation is 0.22 for real time. Yes. That's going to mean that for some people, um, let's say uh, people who are one standard deviation above the mean, uh, for each point in increase in real time, they're so going to get like, some, some like 50, 0.50-ish or something. Right, so every two days they're getting one point increase effectively. Okay. Yeah. So is is there a way to um, look for a t-test between a specific person's slope and zero? Like to say yes. that, okay, this person's slope is different. Yeah, then. for that I would calculate this, do a mini regression for each participant mm -hmm. and look at their slopes. Um, then you're reducing the data down to 14 points so you may just think about the size of the slope rather than adding P to it, because um, you're splitting. Uh, we actually should get the slopes as part of the analysis. What That's we what I was going to say. Yeah. So you put it as a random effect, and you also have it as a fixed factor. That means you have the estimate for each participant to show you what they differ from the, the mean, the grand mean. Okay. For, for yes. I've, I've done this before in another, uh, another project, and uh, we actually had to do that to do like a random, uh, an individual differences analysis to no. show how much the growth curve was different for each, each person. person. But we didn't do any type of t-test from like the mean, we just said they were within one standard deviation or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and some yeah. people use this as a starting point to then create classifiers. Yes, that's what yeah. I was, yeah. Um, with, you know, like I'll use a latent class analysis, this is one of the more traditional statistics, or um, if you go more like a uh, machine learning mm -hmm. based classifier. I don't know why this is being mean to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can pull the numbers, and I can add the code to show you the exact. It's it's got the same issue as before, where you have to remember. Okay, this is the first one. So let me start here. You have to remember it's a change in the parameter. Studio Cloud's like, aren't you done yet? Stop talking. There we go. So I think it's kind of the same way we did it before. So model four, dollar sign, let's see, coefficients. So now we've got, um, for each participant, we have their intercept and their, or their difference in their intercept and their difference in real time. So remember that this is, um, there are four points above the intercept, which is actually negative in the study, um, and this person's slope is 0.2 higher. Okay. So that's the tricky part, so you have to remember that it's mm -hmm. the difference from the fixed effect, the average. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So we could look and see that there are several participants that are negative. Mm -hmm. We've got some participants who are getting worse over time. Mm -hmm. um, potentially maybe because we're telling them you are not adhering to your, to your values. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they realize that they're, they're not doing well. Um, I can't remember when they ran the study. Uh, if That was another thing we had to control for is they had different start points. Um, if it was close to finals or not. Mm -hmm. the, we ended up doing a paper on the stress component. So can we predict st daily stress based on all these different mm -hmm. variables? And a lot of them wrote things like, I have a biology exam. <laughs> so. And with this, you can, um, you can deduce, I guess, um, if a person's slope is very close to zero, then they didn't get affected um, by the treatment at all. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can, um, for, for each person, so you can compare that to um, zero or whatever chance level is for that particular data structure. Then you could get a, maybe a tally of how many people's regression slopes were different from, from zero. zero. Mm -hmm. And then instead of um, taking the uh, summary from the model, we can look at a tally. You can say like 60% part, um, of participants were affected and not affected. Does that, is that dumb or is that a really? No, I think. It'd be like an individual the difference analysis, is, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and what, what I would do, for example, like with what you have right there, is this your data? Or uh, this is a, the study that I collaborated with a small portion of the data, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like, for example, you could do a scatter plot of the intercepts and the slopes, and then looking at where they lie, like if you did it divided into quadrants, you could be like, this many were in this quadrant, well, that would mean they had like a significant growth, or it was another quadrant where there's other people that didn't, you know, mm -hmm. didn't change, something like that. Oh, that's a great so example. Yeah. yeah, that would be actually very easy to plot. You do plot, uh, coefficients, you have to get down into let's see, <laughs> all of the dollar signs. At least it's, I think that should work. Oh, wait, there's one more. Right? Maybe not on the fixed bar. I think here I have to tell it intercept, right? Oh wait, you wanted to do random by random, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, so oh, okay. Random intercept relation slopes is for each participant. This is why you almost never see me live code, because I cannot. I know it's the worst. Spell. I saw since that class, I'm like, I know how to type, I swear I'm not doing that. I think one more second. I'm gonna have to do, can I do column one like this? Call rows and then columns, right? Yeah. All the rows and columns. Ah, there we go. This is ugly code. There we go. So that would be. So you have the slopes on the bottom on the X? No, intercepts. Intercepts, okay. Yeah. So we got to Oh, you want to switch them? If you put like a horizontal line, for example, at zero, anyone above that had positive growth, anyone below that? Negative growth. And then these, this cluster here basically is just not changing because they're right at zero if this is the slope. Um, but they're also way above average. Yeah. So it, Some started above, I guess. It could be partially due to like at zero here. These people aren't changing that much because they're already yeah. at ceiling. This, this scale um, does not go very high. It was almost like uh, heteroscedastic. Like you have the very the variability for the negative five variable. And that, to tie back to the beginning, is why um, the homoscedasticity isn't a huge deal because you can usually control for it. Because this megaphone shape would normally just be in the residuals. But I mean, that's, that's useful information too, right? So like the people that already have, that were, what, is that, what is the intercept mean if I have stress? Uh, progress in this one. Progress. So adherence to the values, they'll probably watch this later and yell at me for misinterpreting, but um, <laughs> adherence to our own values and progress towards achieving your like, values yeah, and life goals. people that were already higher, they didn't change. Like, that, makes sense. Yeah. that makes sense, but uh, there are also people who started negative and also went negative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, what does that mean? Right? So that, those people might be, if you're trying to classify, <laughs> trying to, the people you're trying to target for clinical services. Mm -hmm. right. People love this clinical stuff. I have a really great paper too on, um, you can show me the files, what's the studio doing? Um, I'll just hit knit one more time. Um, body checking. And so 
um, body so, you know, body checking tends to lead to body dysmorphia and um, bulimia, anorexia, but like bad mental health problems um, with perceptions of size. So we did a study where we tested women five times a day for five days, these poor students that handled this project. Um, and what we found was super interesting uh, because when you plotted the data, what you see is a scallop effect. So overall body checking goes down across the majority of the study. So just by forcing them to think about how many times they looked at themselves in the mirror, like pinched their thighs, um, you get decreases in that area, but also increased throughout the day. So it's something we would never would have seen without this kind of model. Um, and so their, their interpretation of that was um, that more interactions with other people, more opportunities, because in the morning you're kind of sleepy. <laughs> um, it was an, an interesting effect to find. So All right. More opportunities for what? So there, the slopes increased throughout the day but decreased across days. So what their interpretation of that was that by having being awake longer and basically having more opportunities to check and being around more people, that social component was causing them to increase their checking throughout the day and then they kind of reset on the next day. That's, it. That's like a, a mm -hmm. cool example of like a Samson's paradox, right? Where it seems like overall trend is like this, but it's like each individual mm -hmm. one is going, yeah, that's super cool. Well, it wasn't not fun. For, not for them, it wasn't like, fun to explain. Like I was like, this is just plot the data. <laughs> and I was like, what is happening in this data? Because it was like, you could tell when they went to sleep, right? And then this weird scalp effect. Um, we're leaving. Okay, so we added this. If I compare models, um, I can tell. Going back to this growth example, that the random slopes are important. And so in this kind of model, you maybe don't want random slopes. It's kind of weird. Can you pick Either way is interesting. So the uh, things that they were talking about, this idea that I could see that there are different participants have different paths through the study, uh, and I could use that to further inform another study. Um, if you're trying to pre present this is the way that this intervention works and everyone gets better, a random slope may not be the best effect. Um, but this would allow you to explore how people respond differently when there's usually a time component. With the effect size, uh, this is to me super interesting because our predictors are actually you know, point pin. If I think about normal numbers, this is about medium effect. But do good grief, mm -hmm. there's a lot of variance. So um, it's hard sometimes to report these because people think that you're saying that your R squared values are point, point 0.7 and they're like, what you you making these numbers up, right? These are very big numbers for participant data. Um, but what we're actually saying is 50% of the variance is people just being different from each other. Um, and so I could tell how much my random slope added by subtracting these. So I got another 5% with the random slope. And this test statistic, this effect size can range between zero and one, right? Yes, so like it's, it's not R squared uh, in a variance overlap kind of way. It's not quite pseudo R squared. It's somewhere in the middle, um, but it has the same properties. Okay. Excellent, okay. So I also included some links if you wanted to do this as a structural model. Um, I teach this in my SEM course and I have a couple videos of like a me lecturing. It's basically the same idea of the lecture. This is in Levon in R, um, which you can also do Levon in JASP if you, if you're familiar with the JASP program. Okay. So in your, um, in your opinion, what, what is the benefits, for example, of using a SEM model instead of a what, what do you get from that that you don't get from the other one? I would, I would do it as a sim model if I wasn't trying to nest. Because one problem with Levon is that it doesn't, they're working on it, but it doesn't currently have the ability to do a multi-level. Uh -huh. I think one of the only good ones for that is in plus. Um, yeah, I know nothing about structural statistics and models. I hope you know. Maybe you need to know more about this. I, sometimes they're, they're, their degrees of freedom are totally different, so it might be a, I think you need to push the, the one button on the little No, it wants you out, though. I bet you might be able to switch it. One? Laptop one? Um. <laughs> no! We were doing so good. She says really mad sometimes. Okay. Well. Okay. All right. So, a logistic example. 
because the code for these is a little a little different. Um, so. By the way, you were missing the previous slide from the version one? that I had here. Why, why did that be missing? Which one? This one? Um, growth infestation. Yeah, I don't have that in the um, project when you provided. Did you just update your? No. Let's see, other people see it. Oh. We'll, yeah. yeah, we can figure it out. Um, and then the channel is easy to find because the statistics of doom. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to find these, I like Googled statistics of doom, uh, latent growth. I don't talk on them. I have a list somewhere of all of them, but I'm almost at 500 videos. So. Um, yeah, I don't remember how we got connected on Twitter, but some markdown question probably yeah, that you so. solved for me. <laughs> I'm terrible at markdown sometimes. Um, but so my research, I kind of, I have three kind of big things to do applied statistics stuff, um, what we're calling um, meta science, like better statistical practices. Uh, but my original area is in metacognition and linguistics so thinking about how people think about their own memory networks and uh, how terrible they are at them and then how do we model memory networks uh, so what we did in this study this was a, a side project i did in graduate school that one day i will write 10 years later but uh, it's a really great logistic example so I use the OSPAN task the OSPAN is a measure of working memory it's horrible participants hate it because they, has anyone taken a nose span? I yeah, you can see that's why you're laughing. Um, you ask people to solve simple math problems. It's two times two plus two equal to six. Uh, they say yes or no, and then you show them a letter. And at the end of five or six of these trials, they have to write down the letters in order. Mm. Um, so it's pretty awful. Uh, so the nose span task ranges from they get none to 75 right in the automated version. Uh, we measure their math skills, so how many times they're getting the math questions right, controlling for those differences. And then the, the uh, Ravens progressive matrices, which is a measure of fluid intelligence. So they give you like a puzzle to solve. And so you, you guess what the correct pattern is. Uh, and then we had them judge words. So if I give you cheddar and cheese, how, or just, no, this study, um, if I give you cheddar, how many different words are related to cheddar? Is it low or is it high? Well, as we were testing uh, across five or six studies if the way that we asked the question mattered. So if I had you actually guess a number, if I had you guess from you know, zero to 15, or if I just said, just give me binary, is it low or is it high? Is it five of them or is it 20, essentially? Um, so for example, computer has a lot of associates, uh, but things like uh, dance, I think is one of the, the smaller numbers. So we had we had words that were low and words that were high. Um, and we're trying to predict their rating. So can we guess which one they guess? The number of associates is the other predictor. Right? So given the actual number of associates, can we guess how well they guess? And for this, I just included um, participant number as the random variable. I didn't use uh, item because item is inherently tied to associates. And so I think I tried it and it didn't matter, so I left it out. So in this particular one, this is just how I had to recode it. But anytime you're doing logistic regression, you need to make sure your dependent variable is a factor. Uh, sometimes it'll run without, but it's generally cranky if you don't make it a factor. I gave them the labels, and then you can see we each have each participant by um, the trial. So here's some examples of bum. <laughs> <laughs> chauffeur, chowder. There's only like 20. It's a really quick study, and then we put them in the OS band and they hate us. Right. Um, what they actually guess, uh, this is the real answer if we look at the associates, but we use the continuous measure instead uh, their OS band score, the math score, and their rating score. Okay. So, can I predict whether they guess low or high? So, in a logistic regression, you have to make sure that the uh, balance of the outcomes is not super weighted one way or the other. So I don't want to try to predict 90% to 10% because it's really easy to get a good model. It just guesses everything in the 90 category. Um, so this is almost two to one. The, the actual low to high should be 50-50. So uh, our participants are clearly not doing well. Um, 
Is it ever too to take this into account, making the default chance basically a solution to model slice? Oh, okay. like a prior probability? Yeah. You probably have to do Bayes. Oh, okay. Cringe. Yeah. I don't mind Bayes, I just don't totally get it. So I feel like uh, trepidatious going into doing the models because I'm afraid I'm going to misinterpret them. Okay. And it's too much. Well, I like, so BRMS, I, people love this package because yeah. it does all this stuff in a Bayes way. Um, That's what I'm teaching you guys in the day. Oh, sweet. Uh, maybe I can learn a thing. <laughs> um, I have some friends doing it. They're like, you need to switch. And I'm like, I'm afraid. I just am not going to understand what's going on. And I want to be able to explain what my model's doing. Yeah. Um, and apparently, according to one of my friends, that you could fry an egg on your computer with how hot mm -hmm. they run sometimes. When you have a lot of data, it takes forever. Mm -hmm. so. Well, <clears throat> so we're going to switch packages. We're going to use LME4, because um, that's where the glimmer, some people call this the glimmer function. Um, so the irony of using the nonlinear one for the linear models and the linear one for the nonlinear models is not lost on me. Um, but I think in LME has a much better, cleaner interface. Uh, but in LME, there's a, the family option is a little bit easier than the nonlinear part in, in LME, personally. <laughs> okay. um, so you're gonna load in, L, in uh, LME4, it's gonna tell you about all these things that it's done. Um, the first model, the, the intercept only model is a little different. So notice this time we're using GLM instead of GLS because GLM allows us to do this family option. Okay. This is really the only difference. So I'm using a binomial family because I have two outcomes. Uh, it'll let you do Poisson, uh, Logit, Gaussian, and inverse normal. Like there's a bunch of options. Um, and if you search family options in R, you can see what they all are and how to define them. Okay. And if I look at my intercept, so the intercept here is gonna, oops, I went on to the next model. So here's my model that breaks. The intercept in a logistic model, um, one more, essentially tells me kind of the proportion in group two. So that's slightly higher because the people are guessing high a lot more. So predicting. We, it would be easy for us to predict the high category. Now, this is where it goes nuts. So the definition of a random effect is now not in a nice spot where it says random. You actually put it in as part of the equation, which you'll notice it hopefully looks very similar. I don't even know that you need the parentheses. I just, I'm attached to them because it's the first way I learned it. Um, but you still have the um, intercept type and then the name of the effect. So the random notation has just moved into the formula. Um, the family is still binomial. This control option here, there's three or four options for the optimizer. Um, I use this one. I don't know how to say this. Yeah, I've never heard anyone actually say it aloud, but this is the one that tends to work best for me. There's a couple more that you can use. There's a non lopped R one that's also pretty popular. Um, which one runs? I mean, very practically. Which one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which one runs? That's okay. the one I always use. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is the most popular, and it tends to be the most stable for me, anyway. Um, and then this uh, NAGQ option is an approximation, mm -hmm. so it's trying to approximate the, the distribution of the parameter. Uh, if you put in zero, it is the fastest running option and uses the simplest approximation. One is a Laplace transform. Um, the bigger the number, the better the approximation, but the slower the model runs. Uh, a lot of people suggest leaving it at the default is actually one. Um, and then our NA models. Options. So if I nest by participant, there should be a lot of variability here in our study because we found that people are um, different, uh, different metacognitive abilities. Sometimes they're good at understanding their own memory, sometimes they're bad. Um, and so I do see a lot of variance. It's here in the um, effect for you know, guessing low versus high. So now I'm going to throw in all of my predictors. And again, the order doesn't matter. So I could have left this one first. Uh, 
threw them all in, and this is where you'll start to see the error messages. So this model is not good, and I kind of left it like this on purpose so that you could see what one looks like when they fail. So what's happening is it's iterating. You'll get this failing to converge, and it tells you its tolerance level. Um, so this number is like kind of where it got st stuck on iterating. Uh, and the tolerance is 0.01. So it's this kind of, I, I don't know a good way to explain this without getting into a, a lot of unfortunate math. But essentially it has a, 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 the solution needs to meet a certain criteria. Tolerance is its criteria, and this is where it stopped. So I'm not very close. And then it helpfully kind of tells you why it failed. So in this particular case, it's because the, the scale of the variables is very different. So one of them ranges from kind of five, it's got a big break in the middle, sensor data to 20. Uh, the host band is zero to 75. Ravens is zero to 26. Math is only like 50 to 90. So maybe we should um, scale the data to fit the model a little bit better so that it can, this is especially a problem with logistic models. Okay. Um, I did not do that be because I wanted to show you what it looks like when it crashes, but unfortunately what happens, especially when I'm working with students, is that you actually do get estimates. <laughs> it's, it's very easy to just kind of like ignore that it told you that this is not a good model to look at. Um, so just be careful there um, and don't ignore the error message. So when I do structural equation modeling, the output is so long, and the error message is at the very top. <laughs> you know you're having a lunch party. <laughs> um, so don't forget to look at the top if you get a lot of output. And then if I wanted to add, um, oh, sorry, why am I getting the error? So some, maybe they're highly correlated, so it's multicollinearity error. In my particular case, they're very, very different scales, so I should probably scale or z-score the data to see if that helps. Um, or what we ended up doing in this paper that's half written is um, we add them one at a time until we found the, the problem child. <laughs> yeah. And then we scaled them all and it, the error went away. Okay. But that makes interpretation a little bit harder in a z-scored logistic regression. It makes understanding the predictors difficult. Okay. Then if I wanted to add a random intercept, our prediction would have been it varied by working memory. So your ability to think of all of the words that are related to these words. So you add it in the same place. So I just wanted to show you code for two different types of models that they're, they're very similar. Um, but the main component is that you can add the family control of the optimizer in LME. And, uh, it's not as easy in an LME. And then now this time, it's really mad at me. It's telling me to have a singular matrix, so something is really wrong. Okay. Um, so don't interpret a model that tells you you have a singular matrix. <laughs> All right. However, for the moment, I am going to interpret them. <laughs> for purposes of, of ending up. So uh, the other key thing is I can't use the ANOVA function on all of them because they're different families of the of models. So I, what I always do is print out the AIC for my uh, non-nested model, and then I use the ANOVA function on all the rest of them. Um, and so I can see that I'm getting a decrease from one a non-nested intercept to a nested intercept, and then actually the last model is not helpful. So if they're not it's also a singular matrix, so you know, if it were a good model, um, I could tell that that random inner slope was not useful. And so to me, this is the, the dangerous part about these coding systems, is that both of those models are actually, you shouldn't even use, and I wish they would just stop. But they actually will give you their best a guess of the, what the estimate was uh, for purposes of maybe start points, getting a better iteration, but then it's very tempting to interpret them my kind of warning. Uh, and then R squared GLMM now, finally, yay, works on logistic models as well. But this would definitely be pseudo R squared in a logistic model. So if the data were any good, I usually tend to use a theoretical line. 2% um, of their metacognitive abilities are predicted by all of our variables. All right, so in summary, 
hopefully you've learned a lot. Yes. Uh, so giving you some examples of linear MLMs and their assumptions and their effect size, logistic, the only assumption is really that you have at least somewhat even data to estimate uh, and no multicollinearity. Um, an extension to this that I didn't think I would have time to cover because it um, can be kind of hard is stimulating power uh, for sample size requirements, uh, which would be the Britsbert article, I would suggest. And then I have, I have just so many tutorials. It's out of control at this point. Uh, but the Stats Tools website is really good if you're ever asked to teach a course um, because it has like a course layout, all the videos that go with it and all of the materials. But then my YouTube channel is more just like, what program do you want this in and what uh, analysis? So if you wanted uh, SPSS, which hopefully no one does, but you could do SPSS, repeated measures ANOVA, and you would find a video for that. Um, or R, and I've also done videos, I'm adding Python and JASP. So, slowly adding more and more. Right. So that's all I've got. Questions, thoughts? Um, could you go back to the know. singular fit and that just that part one? Why is it bad that it's a singular fit and we should so, interpret the model? Right, so sing a singular matrix. And, um, so when you're doing regression, uh, what happens mathematically is it's trying to basically multiply various matrices together, so you're solving backwards for the coefficients. A singular matrix implies that you can't multiply them together, or short, you can't flip the matrix. Um, and so that usually is caused by two variables that are too highly correlated. Uh, in our case, it's probably also due to the scaling of the data, since we're doing logistic regression. Um, so it, without, I guess, like, getting into the math, it implies that the, the estimates that it's giving me are not appropriate because it's estimating on a data matrix that it can't actually solve the solution for. Mm -hmm. And how would it generate generate the the estimates? Uh, there are in uh, start points in the background uh, that you can actually control. You can tell it what to start estimating on. So what some people do. I would first solve the scaling issue, um, is take these estimates and tell it to start there. Um, so these, uh, in a Bayesian model, you have the same problem where, depending on where, like let's say you're doing a Markov chain, kind of, it can get stuck sometimes. And so we essentially provide these as a way to get unstuck. So that's why they left them in there. I understand why they provide them, but I wish the warning message was bigger or something. <laughs> Students have this problem too on the structural equation models. There's this idea called the Haywood case, where the solution that it gives you is inappropriate because it says the variance is negative. Mathematically, variance can't be negative. Um, but the line is like one little line at the top of like six pages of output. <laughs> Can you put it at the bottom too, maybe? At the top and the bottom. Um, so it's easy to miss. And now she's an angel. <laughs> Data model that was giving you a hard time. Yes. How will you fix it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, since we have some time, let's see if I can see if I can make it work. I think if I remember correctly, what we did was yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's model three where it goes wrong. Right. It is at least in red. I didn't show up. Um, before is I just started scaling them all. Did you scale all of them? Uh, that's where I started. Yeah. Because the idea being now they were at least all in the same where zero indicates the average score. Stop the <laughs> oh, I see this is where moderation I also like to talk about interactions, and that actually solves it. Um, but now I have to interpret these predictors as z scored or beta values for logistic regression. So that's why it can be hard. But um, uh, the general idea being that the only useful variable is their actual associates. So um, as there are more associates, they are guessing that there are more. And you said these values are in Z score units. 
Okay. So one standard deviation change in the I think that's much better than the two. I, for me, I think it's easier too. Yeah. No, I mean, see, I've always. You have to know the standard deviation is, yeah. yeah. I, mm, or at least if you want to compare the other one, this is Yes, like that's why I like beta, is um, comparison points. But I don't know, maybe I spend too much time talking to, well, to non stats people where I'm explaining it like, well, for every single extra word, we get this much likelihood of guessing another uh, right. higher one. That's more intuitive. Yeah, yeah. so. That's also because of my new job. I spent a lot of time talking to like corporate people. So, so something that, that he mentioned before that I think is interesting. He said about not weighting it somehow. The like if you know that it should be like around a third or something like that. I know that the, the that function actually has a weights argument, mm -hmm. but I don't use it, so I don't really know. But that's I something. Don't remember that maybe, if uh, that's the weights for the variables, like the start points, or if that's right. the weight, the prior probability of the categories. Yeah, I don't know. So that probably isn't the help. The help for this package is very good. Yeah. Um, but uh, the pro uh, this specific to this problem is that it, uh, the answer should be 50-50. Right. So the prior probabilities are actually 50-50. The, <laughs> the, <participants laughs> yeah. the participants are actually yeah. really bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> and we have, we have a really cool paper where we were using some new, um, it's called observation-oriented modeling, comes out of Oklahoma State. Um, it's essentially a chi-square permutation test, um, but it doesn't require any of these assumptions, so we compared that to us running just regular regression slopes on 10 different of these types of studies, and it's just so in, invariant. Like participants just continuously are bad at this, um, which matches a lot of cognitive literature on judgments of learning, like you're not good at estimating your own abilities. Right? On the low end, you think you're good. On the high end, you think you're bad. Yeah. <laughs> 